Welcome to the seventh video in this series of the Let's Calc videos. In this video, which is being filmed on July 4th, interestingly enough, so happy Independence Day, we're going to be talking about limits at infinity. So specifically, we're going to be talking about end behavior. We're going to be describing horizontal asymptotes, end behavior asymptotes, if you will, if you want to call them that. We're going to be talking about things that go to infinity and things that don't. We're going to be comparing magnitudes of functions. And we're going to be looking at how you can break down functions and evaluate the ratios of those functions. So lots of little good stuff here. Without further ado, let's jump in. I always got to press that button. Okay, the first question, and the first set of questions we're going to look at, we're going to look at a good number of questions from that first chunk of the assignment, which simply ask you to evaluate each limit, each one going towards either positive or negative infinity, request us to show any relevant work, and if a limit doesn't exist, explain why it does not. And typically that explanation, as you'll see in a couple questions, or at least one question, will be something involving oscillation probably. So if we run into one of those, we'll talk about it when we get there. For the moment, where we wanted to start off here was a function that is easy to forget about as far as the end behavior world goes. No, I haven't played for my virus checker, I apologize. As I said, where we want to start is a function type that we haven't run into um, and haven't necessarily dealt with today. Everything's been focused on rational type functions or functions that have one function over another. In this case, we're starting with just a simple polynomial. And we're asked to evaluate the limit as x goes to negative infinity of x cubed plus 5x plus 1. Now, we don't need to be super specific, or we don't need to be super precise when we try to imagine what this function looks like. We don't need to know its zeros or anything. We don't even need to know its y-intercept or x-intercepts, although some of those might be easy. All we need is to think about what's happening as x approaches negative infinity, which back in earlier courses you probably called left end behavior. So we're looking for what the left end behavior is doing here. So we might just describe it a little bit differently. So as I think about this, and again we're using Franklin terms here for the moment, what I see is because I see that we have a degree 3, so I'll narrate this stuff out here, because our degree equals 3, which is odd, that implies that we have a graph or a function that behaves like a noodle. And of course, noodles just mean a particular type of end behavior. Starts in one direction, ends in the other. Doesn't matter whether it starts high or starts low. Second, because that leading coefficient is positive 1, in fact, we'll just say a equals 1 is greater than 0, that means that we don't just have a noodle, but a positive noodle. And am I sure? Yes, I'm positive. Noodle. So in that case, what, that, what we're looking at is instead of having these two options, a positive noodle behaves just like the classic cubic function. So basically, this isn't our option that we're going to be looking at. It's going to look like this. Now, why is that relevant? Specifically, that's relevant because of the fact that it tells us what's happening as x approaches negative infinity. So if there's our x-axis and we're going in that direction, we're looking at what the y-values are doing as we travel in that direction, and clearly the y-values are going down, which tells me that this particular limit is going to be equal to negative infinity. So even though it's irrational and we didn't have to do any particular fancy work, in fact, you necessarily could have, you could have probably not written anything and just written this down as your answer and been okay. I think it's important to remember that what this is describing is what the function is doing. So in this case, we're going to say that the end behavior is approaching negative infinity because as x gets more and more negative, y gets smaller and smaller or more and more negative as well. So there you go. There's number one. That takes us to number three as our next one. And number three is kind of the classic problem. This one you've answered in the past, but you just maybe weren't asked with the limit in the past. So in this case, we're asked to evaluate the limit as x approaches negative infinity. So negative infinity, again, as it turns out, of the ratio between x plus 8 and 3x plus 2. And I will point out before we start things off that this would give you the same value as the limit as x approaches positive infinity for what that's worth, since this is a true rational expression. So now from here, though, what are we going to do? How can we approach this? Well, I'm hoping that through all of this stuff, you could very quickly figure out that the answer is one third. So I will point out that although we're going to do a bunch of work here in just a second, the answer is not difficult to come by. In fact, you probably remember it, not formally, but you remember that this just means take the leading term of the numerator, put it over the leading term of the denominator, and see what you get. And if it simplifies to a number, that's your horizontal asymptote, or we'd call it our limit. But I want to point out that that's not actually the formal way to approach this problem. That's not what's happening under the surface of the mechanic that you remember. Like that mechanic is just kind of a way to get through the answer without showing the proper work. So instead what I want to do is I want to illustrate what this actually looks like. So I'm going to start by writing out the expression, just like we have it up above. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to point out that we can't do any of those things. I mean, technically we could do long division or something and try to do it that way. But there's a quicker, faster way to visualize what's happening here without having to do polynomial long division. And that is we could multiply up and down by the same number without changing this expression. 
So for instance, if we wanted to be cool, we could multiply up and down by 42. Now that wouldn't do anything to help us evaluate this limit, but we could do that because it's not changing the problem when you multiply by 42 over 42, also known as one. It's just one in disguise. So instead, what we're gonna do is we're gonna multiply by a particular thing up and down, and then we're gonna see what it simplifies to. Now specifically, I'm gonna find the highest degreed term of any part of this function. I notice in both cases it's a power of x, or it's x to the first power. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna multiply up and down by one over x to that power. And technically it doesn't have to be one, it's just most convenient if you choose one. So I'm doing this, why am I doing this? In a sense what I wanna do is I wanna take out for a second, or I wanna, what's the word? I wanna like neutralize, I wanna calm down, I wanna steady, I wanna slow the growth, I don't know. I wanna be able to see what's happening here as x goes to infinity, but at the moment, if we looked at our original piece, if we plugged in negative infinity, by the way, and this is probably where I should have started, we would get negative infinity plus eight, and in the bottom, we'd have negative three infinity plus two. And by the way, if you're not sure, that's equal to negative infinity over negative infinity, which is actually indeterminate, just like zero over zero. So for the record, if we end up with zero over zero, or some sort of infinity over infinity, both of those things require us to do something else. So this is our algebraic something else that we can legally do. So in attacking this particular piece, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna distribute that one over x into both terms of the numerator and both terms of the denominator. When I do, I'll end up with the limit as x approaches, oops, negative infinity. It's kind of fun writing the infinity symbol, honestly. And then the numerator will have x over x plus eight over x. That's just me distributing. I don't think it's particularly fancy. This will be three x over x plus two over x. And if we want to simplify this just a little bit, we'll do this as the limit as x approaches negative infinity of one plus eight over x divided by three plus two over x. Now in a sense, one could make the argument, I'd call it a cynical argument, but we are who we are. One could make the argument that this has just made the entire thing a little bit more nasty than it was before. I would not argue, but I would disagree with you that this hasn't helped us because now we're actually ready to plug in and perform direct substitution. Watch what that looks like. We get one plus eight divided by negative infinity over three plus two divided by negative infinity. And that is going to be equal to one, let's see, if we just deal with that negative sign, let's play it really carefully here. One minus eight over infinity, pulling out the negative sign, over three minus two divided by infinity. And now we ask you that very important question from the infinite limits assignment before. What is a finite value divided by infinity? You know, what is your pizza? If you have to share it with all trillions of people or eight billion people, nine billion people, I don't know, overpopulation is scary. So from there, whatever you'd say, you'd say that those things are zero. It's getting smaller and smaller. So in other words, this is one minus zero over three minus zero, which simplifies to one third. And oh look, oh look, it's exactly what we knew the answer was gonna be. I just did it longer, I took longer, and I did more work for it. So, some would call that a victory. Maybe not you. But for the purposes here, what I was trying to do is illustrate what it is that's happening when you take the leading terms and put them over each other and then evaluate that limit. We're seeing it in action here, we're getting to use some infinite limit properties, it's a really neat thing. Now again, when you do this on a test, or on a multiple choice question or something, what do I expect you to do? probably just write one third and be done with it. But it's good to understand why things are working because that helps build all of this foundation for you that will only grow and become more involved later. So just keep that in mind. Okay, that brings us to question number seven. And seven is a problem that I do in my head. I always have done it in my head. I learned it in a particular technique. That technique wasn't as formal as I would have liked it to be. So here this year, I'm gonna finally attack this thing through the formal way, even though I'll understand if on an exam you evaluate it just simply doing it the fastest possible way possible. But again, for here, I'm gonna do it as formal as I can. So let's take a look. So we're asked to do another limit. This is question number seven, by the way, if you somehow can't read that number on the left side of the screen, you should probably get your eyes checked. So this is asking us to evaluate the limit as x approaches negative infinity of 84x cubed minus seven over the square root of four x to the sixth plus 14. So to start with, what I wanna do is I do wanna perform a little bit of controlling term analysis before I jump in and start doing things properly, or properly, or I can speak with the British. So in looking on here, what I wanna point out is that when we're talking about growth and going to an infinity, negative seven and plus 14 just don't contribute a whole lot. 
they're just not helpful very much. They're just kind of a grain of sand in the beach. Still nice, not a bad thing, definitely there, but not necessarily helping a lot. So what I'm going to do before anything else, I'm going to point out that this limit is equivalent to the limit as x approaches negative infinity of 84x cubed divided by the square root of 4x to the sixth. So again, what I'm doing in a sense is I'm neglecting those pieces. I'm just admitting that the x cubed and the square root of x to the sixth terms, those things control the growth of this function. Those other constants are just loose little pieces. They're little pebbles, you know, just not as helpful. So we'll start there. Now, here's where things get a little bit off and kind of mess with some people. If I ask you, as probably have at some point, what this is equal to, you probably all would say the same thing. That's equal to x. And yeah, yeah, x is not the worst answer you could have said. You could have said cockroach, and that would have been totally wrong. But the answer isn't actually x. In fact, to prove this to you, let's go to Desmos really fast and just illustrate once and for all that that's not actually the function that you get. So let's see here. So we have, oops, y equals the square root of x. Okay, before we get there, here, before we get in there, let me remind you, this is y equals x. Okay, straight line, just, you know, 45 degrees through the origin, slope one. Here's y equals the square root of x squared. What is that? Can't hear you. Yeah, that is actually not x, but the absolute value of x. So put that in your mind for a second. That's actually what we're looking at. The reason I bring that up is that if we want to evaluate this thing, we can't just start slashing stuff, and we can't just evaluate the square root of 4x to the sixth as 2x to the third. So instead, as we begin to attack this thing, we need to rewrite it as 84x cubed, because nothing was really happening up there, over the absolute value of 2x cubed. So it's an absolute value because the square root of something to an even power becomes absolute value because you can put pluses or minuses in there. So bear with me, kind of weird. Again, this is just showing the mechanics of it. If you have a faster way to do it, like some of the other ways I talk about, go for it. But here we are. Now a couple things. Absolute value of 2 is just 2. So I'm going to go ahead and pull out something here. I'm going to do 84 over the absolute value of 2. I'm just playing it with the absolute value for the moment. That looks like 121, but bear with me. Maybe I can make this bigger. Maybe that convinces you. And then times the limit as x approaches negative infinity of what is x cubed over the absolute value of x cubed. So now a couple things here. 84 over 2 is equal to 42. And if we have the limit as x goes to infinity of absolute or x cubed over absolute value of x cubed, I'll point out to you that you can rewrite this as the absolute value of x cubed. And better yet, you can rewrite the entire limit the limit as x goes to negative infinity, sorry, I forgot a negative up there, by the way, you can rewrite it as that, x over absolute value of x to the third power. And then, you can see I'm getting kind of into this, at this point, you can also use limit properties to rewrite this as 42 times the quantity, limit as x approaches negative infinity of x over absolute value of x to the third power. So that's a lot of work to get somewhere, and we still have an awkward limit to evaluate. But we've done this in the past. I don't know if you recall this, but hopefully you will soon, because it's definitely going to be on your exam. But x over the absolute value of x is a particular function. I believe it has a couple other names. I just want to say the Dirichlet function is this thing as well. But remember, this has a magnitude of 1 every single time. But if x is less than 0, like say here, we get negative 1. And if x is greater than 0, we get positive 1. So this is our function before. So we want to evaluate the limit as x approaches negative infinity of this function. So as x approaches negative infinity, we're approaching negative 1, which means this limit is 42 times negative 1 to the third power. Negative 1 times negative 1 times negative 1 is negative 1. God, I'm so careful. You guys are so fortunate to get this much extra writing. And that means this entire value is equal to negative 42. So again, that is the most involved way to approach this problem. That is the most precise way to do it. This is the formal approach to take outside of maybe the early work that I did with controlling terms. But I do want to point something else out. If you don't like that, it's important that you understand why it works. But if you don't like that, you can, of course, go back to the beginning and take a look at that expression that we had right here. In fact, because I'm kind of tired and I've been talking through a lot of video here, let me point out this. 
as x goes towards negative infinity, would you agree with me that the numerator is going to be negative? You, you should agree with me because this is 84 times a negative number to the third power, which should be negative. In the denominator, we have the square root of something to an even power. And the square root of something to an even power is definitely positive. In fact, looking at our work here, you can see that that thing stays positive because it's an absolute value. After that, as far as values, you get 84x cubed over 2x cubed. Again, this is less formal than what we did before, but you get negative 42. So if that's the way your mind's working, I can just always assume that this is actually how your mind's working. I just can't tell. So something to point out, there's faster ways to do it, but here it is done as formally as possible. So with that said, let's take a look at the next question. Next question is question number eight, which looks awfully similar to the previous one, just lacks that negative sign. So this is now the limit as x approaches infinity of the same function. So before we begin, and again, I'm doing these as carefully as possible so that you may not may decide not to, there is our limit that we're trying to evaluate. And again, we're gonna to try to approach this in almost the same way. So in looking here, we already talked about the fact that the square root of something squared is equal to the absolute value of x. In our case, looking down here, we have the square root of 2x cubed squared, which is going to be equal to the absolute value of 2x cubed. Voila, we did this in the past. So we write out our limit. As x approaches infinity, we have 84x cubed over. Now I'm going to do something else. I'm going to pull out that 2 just because it won't affect the actual sign. We get 2 over absolute value of x cubed. That's again equal to 42. And then we'll have the limit as x approaches infinity of x over absolute value of x cubed. So I saved ourselves a little bit of work from what we did before to get here. So with that said, now we're supposed to evaluate that limit as x approaches infinity. Remember we talked about what this function looks like. As x goes to negative infinity, or if x is negative, our value is negative 1. But if x is positive, our value is positive 1. That means this is equal to 42 times 1 to the third power, which is just 42 times 1, which is equal to positive 42. So interestingly enough, we get the opposite signed value from 7 when we do question number 8. So now for the moment, you might be asking, like, does this actually work, or why does this work? And more importantly, what does this actually look like? What does our function actually look like when we go to attack it? Well, let's go ask Desmos once more. y equals divide 84x to the third plus... 7? I'm tired. Minus 7. I think it was over square root of 4x to the 6th plus 14. Let me make sure one more time that was correct. Plus 14 it was. So looking at our function here, we have this monstrosity. This. I was going to say at first you're like, wait, this doesn't look very good, but aha! Here we go. So let's see if I can change this a little bit. Let's go minus 30 to 30. Okay, so just looking at our picture, what does it look happening? Notice that as we go towards negative infinity, our values are getting really, really close to 42. And as we go to positive infinity, our values are getting really, really close to 42. In fact, the Desmos even rounds it off. So what we're seeing is a situation where, oops, we're seeing a situation where a particular function actually has two different horizontal asymptotes. One's going towards negative infinity, one's going to positive infinity. And again, although there are fast ways to do this by looking at degree and thinking about sign, it's really easy, it's really nice to just kind of see why it works. And for me, it feels really good to have explained it in as most formal in mathematics as possible. So hopefully that's clarified just a little bit for questions like seven and eight. Okay, next that brings us to nine. And you might think, whoa there, nine looks just like seven and eight. But in fact, there's a huge difference. We have down here, a denominator that has a cube root, not a square root. And this is actually going to affect things pretty significantly. So the first thing I'm going to do, though, before I jump deeply into 9, is I, which is, of course, going to negative infinity, because why not? What I'm going to do is I'm going to do controlling term analysis first. Get negative 6x over the cube root of x to the third. And naturally, the question that's worth asking for us is, what is the cube root of x to the third? So in this case, it's important to think about something here before we go in. First, the cube root of 8 is equal to 2. But what's the cube root of negative 8? 
Hopefully you're saying negative two. Hopefully not in an awkward public place. That would be uncomfortable for you. So in this case, if the radicand is positive, we get a positive number. If the radicand is negative, we get a negative number. So applying that over here, what that tells me is that the cube root of x cubed is going to just be equal to x. That way if x is negative, it stays negative. If x is positive, it stays positive. So in other words, this limit is equivalent to the limit as x approaches negative infinity of negative 6x over x, which by the way, no, is equal to negative 6. So in this case, it does not look like we're actually getting two different end behaviors. We should just have one. Question, of course, always is does that actually show up on our graph? Let's take a look. y equals negative 6x, negative 6x plus 1 over the cube root. Okay, so for cube root, we don't have that built into the function, so I'm going to have to do it that way. I'm going to have x cubed. I can already kind of see it happening. But x cubed, let's do this right. Six, negative 6x plus 11. x cubed plus x plus 2. Okay, negative 6x. Yeah, I did some stuff. We made some mistakes here. Negative 6x plus 11, was it? Plus 11? No, should know that better. Okay, so here's our function. So the question is, does it look like it has a an, a horizontal asymptote of, what was it, just negative 6? Negative 6. Well, let's try this. y equals negative 6. Does it look like that's asymptotic? Yeah, it does. So there's not two asymptotes like there were before. Where we literally have two different behaviors. There's just one, and that's because cube root is 1 to 1. And onto, 1 to 1 and onto, something like that. So with that said... There's our answer. So be careful. I don't think this is something I'm going to necessarily test you on. This is kind of a wrinkle and a twist, but interesting for sure. Don't think you can deny that. Okay, that brings us to question number 12. And question number 12 is exhibit 96,000 in the I'm going to make things more complicated than they need to be. Once again, this is a problem that I can typically do in my head. In fact, I happen to know that this is going to be equal to zero. And you might ask how I know that, particularly because you know that the limit as x goes to infinity of sine of x is oscillating. So there's a very loose way to do this one that involves some bounding stuff, and then there's a more formal way that involves an interesting little theorem that calculus involves. So what I want to point out first is that the old way that I would have done this involved some very basic knowledge of trig, specifically this. And in fact, this is true for all the pieces, so for the moment I'm just going to cut that away. So basically what I know is that sine of x is between negative 1 and 1. As in the largest sine can ever be is 1. That's at like pi over 2 and all the um, coterminal angles with it. And the smallest sine of x can ever be is negative 1. What that means is that 3 sine of x is always going to be between negative 3 and 3. Which means that this limit is effectively the limit as x approaches infinity of a number between negative 3 and 3 over 5x plus 2. And with that in mind, we have just a number over 5x plus 2, which means that this limit effectively is a number over infinity, which should be equal to 0. So that is a very informal way to approach this question, but it does a pretty good, pretty good job of getting us there. But that's not as formal as we could be. In fact, there's a theorem called the squeeze theorem that could actually take care of this for us. And that's how I approached it on the written solutions. Because again, I'm trying to be as formal and comprehensive as possible in all my work. So in looking here, what I want to point out is the same basic start. I'm going to start with this line here. In other words, I'll just kind of trust that you're okay with that piece. And then second, what I'll do is we'll divide all pieces by 5x plus 2. And again, because we're doing it to all three parts of this conjunctive inequality, conjunction, maybe just conjunction, this is always true. And so from there, we basically have an inequality. But what I'm going to do then is I'm going to rewrite this as an inequality involving limits. I'm going to take the limit as x approaches infinity of negative 3 over 5x plus 2 is less than the limit as x approaches infinity. And I should say equal to for all of these. I apologize. These should all be equal to because sine of x can absolutely equal 1. This 3 sine of x can absolutely equal negative 3, etc. So again, we're trying to evaluate the middle one, this sine x one. We know it's got to be between these other two limits. Okay. Jeez, that was so creepy. 3 over 5x plus 2. 
So with that in mind, we now want to evaluate our limit in the middle. So for the moment, forgive me, I'm going to cheat a little bit here. Don't want to write it again. I'm kind of tired of writing it. So in this case, we want to evaluate these limits. Each of these limits, by the way, is going to go to 3 over infinity, which is 0. And hopefully you can trust that that's happening on the left side as well. Which means that the left limit is equal to 0, the middle limit is what we want, and the right limit is 0. Based on this statement, if the limit we want is between 0 and 0, then that limit, as x approaches infinity, of 3 sine of x over 5x plus 2, that limit has to equal 0. That's the only value that can satisfy that inequality. And this is true by a theorem called the squeeze theorem. And the squeeze theorem has not been the most frequently occurring beast. It's kind of been the ivory billed woodpecker of calculus theorems, at least on the AP exam, but it was on the AP test last year on a free response question. So for the moment, we were looking for that answer. We were able to show get it very quickly just by thinking about the size and the boundedness of the function sine or more specifically 3 sine of x, but you can actually use the squeeze theorem, which we talked about a couple assignments back, to actually evaluate this as formally as possible and show that the limit must be equal to zero. And in case you've wondered if that's true, again, trying to show as much as possible of what's happening here, it was 3x plus, or sorry, 3 sine of x over 5x plus 2. Question is, does it look like it's going there? Yeah, it keeps oscillating back and forth, but you can see that it keeps getting smaller and smaller. Look at that, I mean that's that's very, very tight to the x-axis. So it looks like we've done a good job. So there is our answer to question number 12. Okay, next, that brings us to question 14. 14 is actually drawn out of the single most missed question in, I believe, the history of the AP Calculus exam. It was on, I believe, the 2008 test, or something like it was on the 2008 test. It was a multiple choice question with five answer choices. And the number of people answering it correctly was so low that they threw out the question, according to the book that I purchased from that year. So, interesting, but you can be better than all those students in 2008, which I would love to blame my brother's classes, but Mr. Pye loved teaching these things. It wasn't his class that caused that problem, and my brother took the test for AB in 2007. So, oh well, can't throw him under the bus. So what do we have here? Question number 14, we have a ratio of two exponential functions. So in this case, when they want us to find horizontal asymptotes, it's worth remembering that what they want you to find is the limit as x approaches infinity of h of x, and they want you to find the limit as x approaches negative infinity of h of x. Now in some situations, including some of the ones on the assignment, these two values are exactly the same value. But in other situations, that's not the case. And this is one of those situations where you'll actually get two different values. So let's look at each of these limits separately. In fact, I'm even gonna change the color of one of these puppies. Actual puppiness may vary. These aren't as adorable as puppies probably would be. So bear with me. So let's start with the first one. We want to evaluate the limit as x approaches infinity of 2 to the x plus 15 over 2 to the x plus 3. So now if you think about controlling terms, you might be able to get there a little bit faster. But what I notice is that, or what I realize, is that constants don't grow very much. Exponentials grow very, very much. So in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do what we did in the early problems of this assignment. I'm going to multiply up and down by the same factor. And in this case, because 2 to the x is growing the fastest, let's neutralize that growth and multiply up and down by 1 over 2 to the x. So when doing so, again, distributing into our pieces, yay us, we're going to get the limit as x approaches infinity of 2 to the x over 2 to the x. Actually, you know what, I'm here. 2 to the x over 2 to the x plus 15 over 2 to the x. No, okay, you guys can bear with me. 2 to the x over 2 to the x is 1. Deal with it. And then the denominator will have 1 plus 3 over 2 to the x. Now with that in mind, we're going to plug in infinity, which means that we're going to have this equal to 1 plus 15 over 2 to the infinity over 1 plus 3 over 2 to the infinity. Worth pointing out here that that is 15 over infinity. The denominator is 3 over infinity. Both of these then become 1 plus 0 which means the ratio is equal to 1. So the first limit we have is, uh, is 1. On the opposite end, so that should be what's happening as x approaches infinity, by the way. Didn't necessarily specify that enough. Now the next one. 
We want to evaluate the limit as x approaches negative infinity of 2 to the x plus 15 over 2 to the x plus 3. Now in this case, we don't have to do any fancy work at the very beginning. We can actually direct sub in here. And I know that sounds heretical and like it's going to be a dangerous move to make, but watch what happens when we substitute in negative infinity. We're going to get 2 to the negative infinity plus 15 over 2 to the negative infinity plus 3. Now you're never going to believe this, but we're about to see a situation where the constant function actually grows faster. Even though it doesn't grow at all, whatever. In looking here, what do we get? 2 to the negative infinity. Well, anything to a negative power is equal to 1 over that thing to the positive version of the power. So this is really 1 over 2 to the infinity. Hey, we've seen that before. Plus 15 over 1 over 2 to the infinity plus 3. Well, we said before, 1 over 2 to the infinity is just 1 over infinity. And 1 over 2 to the infinity is just as 1 over infinity e as the other one was. Which means that we get 0 plus 15 over 0 plus 3 which is 15 over 3, or 5. So in this case, the negative infinity limit was actually the easier of the two to evaluate, but most importantly, we've actually just identified the fact that there are two different limit values as we approach infinity and negative infinity. And what that means for us is that we actually have two horizontal asymptotes, or as Nelson Muntz from The Simpsons would say, two ha's, or ha ha. So in this case, we've got ha ha's. There we go. So our two horizontal asymptotes, that didn't work, are y equals 1 and y equals 5. So this is something unique to particular types of functions, um, not with rationals. Traditional rationals don't grow this way, but the double exponential does produce two different horizontal asymptotes in the same way that the square root ones produce double horizontal asymptotes. So there you go. We found our two horizontal asymptotes, two different horizontal asymptotes. Let's do that right. Okay, so in 17 through like 21, somewhere in that ballpark, you're asked to evaluate each limit by comparing the magnitudes of the numerator and denominator respectively. So what that means is we want you to use the magnitude information that we hopefully provided in class. If not, I'll provide it to you right now. Basically the idea is certain functions grow faster or more importantly go to infinity faster than other functions do. And there's a hierarchy of these pieces. And the idea is if a numerator, if the functions if the numerator goes to infinity faster than the denominator, then the limit is going to be equal to infinity, whereas if the denominator grows faster, the function should go to zero. So let's narrate a couple of these things. Let's put some of those pieces of information down. First, if you have a rational function, and you're trying to evaluate the limit as x goes to infinity. It doesn't really matter whether it's plus or minus infinity. I think all these focus on infinity, though. And you have a numerator over a denominator if numerator has greater magnitude than denominator and that thing is just my little notation it's like much much bigger as x goes to infinity then the limit as x goes to infinity of the numerator over the denominator is going to be equal to infinity on the flip side if you have the exact same setup here let's do this I'm in a mood to take advantage and not write a million different things. So our next piece. So if on the flip side, you have that the numerator grows or goes to infinity much, much slower than the denominator, then the limit of n over d is going to be going towards zero. Because in other words, the denominator is going to flood and going to be much bigger than the numerator. So with that said, what we're talking about is a particular type of ratios. And before we dig in and do this, like writing it out, we're just going to be looking at some options. Let's look at Desmos and see what this function does as x goes to infinity. So 3dx over x to the fourth. So y equals 3 to the x over x to the fourth. So the question is, what happens as x goes to infinity? Oh boy, it's getting big. It just keeps going. I know there's lots of stuff there, but that one, that's going to up. That's going to infinity. So in other words, this one should go to infinity. On the flip side, if we switch this to x to the fourth over three to the x, look at how that changes things. Obviously, it's a little lumpy in the middle, but then it flattens out and goes to zero. So in a sense, that's what we're looking at. We're trying to give you kind of a shorthand, a, like a quick mental arithmetic or mental math kind of problem that you or attack 
technique that you can use to figure out what these limits are equal to. So you don't have to do a bunch of heavy lifting or later on in the course, L'Hopital's rule. So in here, we want to look at which function grows faster than the other. And the rule of thumb is that there is a hierarchy of functions that we go with. The one that grows the smallest for us are log functions. And again, we're going to assume that the x here is positive. In fact, we're going to do this as x. You know, why don't we do this? As x goes to infinity. Log x grows the, or is the weakest of the growing of the techniques that we have. Although technically, I suppose, if we want to add a little bit more in here, we could say literally just a number n grows less than log because constants are just flat. Next, we have log. After that, we have the nth root of x. So in other words, square roots, cube roots, all those things grow with greater magnitude or go to infinity faster than logs do. After that, we have x to the n. So basically, exponential functions grow faster than that. After that, we have power functions. And so by the way, for all these things, n must be greater than 1, just for what it's worth, just pointing that out to you. And then finally, not that this is going to show up for our purposes, but the function that would be the last one we'll ever have to consider is the factorial function. And that's a factorial. So with that said, that's kind of the order of magnitude that we're going to use. In fact, I might even call this order of magnitude. So we look along this line. Whichever one's the highest will be the one that controls the growth. If the highest is in the numerator, it grows too big, so it goes to infinity. If the highest or the highest magnitude part of the function goes to or is the denominator, then the entire thing goes to zero. So looking at our first example up here, the larger magnitude is right up here because this is exponential and the denominator is polynomial. And we already saw what happens in this particular case. This limit goes to infinity. So a nifty little thing to go through. All it took was us looking at this particular relationship, the order of magnitude relationship. So that was 17. Let's look at 18. I'll obviously leave a few there for you. So in 18, we have two different pieces here. We have the log. It's presented as natural log, but same thing. And we have exponential. So the greatest magnitude is the denominator. So what that tells us is if the bigger thing, or the thing that goes to infinity faster than the denominator, this is going to go to zero. And again, when we get to L'Hopital, you'll be able to see this shown in a different way. But for now, this is a good way to think about it. Which function grows faster? If it's in the denominator, the denominator grows too big. We're dividing by infinity. It goes to zero. And finally, question number 19. Like looking at 19, we can bear a couple other ones here. Once again, I'll paste in our work. As x goes to infinity, we're now comparing a radical with a log. So the radical is the one that grows the fastest. The radical is in the numerator. That means that this limit should go to infinity. You know, for the sake of things, we didn't look at 18, but we can look at 19 really fast. Root x over log x. Y equals root x over log x. Question is, it's supposed to go to infinity. Question is, does it go to infinity? Well, it's going pretty slowly, but it does seem to be getting bigger and bigger and bigger. In fact, look at that. 4, 7, 4, 8, 4, 9. So this is just something that goes to infinity really, really slowly. But that's okay. There's no race. It's not a race. So it still goes to infinity. So there are 17, 18, and 19. Again, these are easy to come up with examples for. And again, whether we talked about this in class, I think this is something you can very quickly pick up on. And if you're looking for like the key to remembering all this stuff, it's basically this line. So something to consider, either a good refresher or um, an introduction of something related to this topic for you. There you go. Okay, next we get to question number 22. 22 is a great type of question. Don't haven't written a whole lot of these in the past, but I'm going to try to write a few more this time, where they give you a graph or some information about a function and say, could this graph actually represent the function? Really rich topic to look at. Ask you to really understand what things mean algebraically and arithmetically and notationally versus what they look like visually and graphically. So in question number 22, the statement of the question says to consider function f of x. Okay, I'm going to do that. Hmm. Consider it considered. Next it says it is known that the limit as x approaches negative infinity of f is equal to the limit as x approaches infinity of f and is equal to 2. So both those two limits are equal to 2. That could be important. 
Then the question asks, could the graph at right represent f of x? Explain why or why not. So could that be the graph of f of x? Well, what I see as most important is that statement about the limits. I think that's pretty obvious. It's the most technical aspect of this question. So if that's true, that these two limits both simultaneously equal two, that means y equals negative two, or sorry, y equals two is a horizontal asymptote. So that's an important spot. So we're looking for a horizontal asymptote. But it's not just a horizontal asymptote. It's a horizontal asymptote as both x goes to negative infinity and as x goes to positive infinity. So the question is then, now that we know this, just again drawing out what that information about that infinite limit means, the question is, could this represent f of x? Well, over on the left side, it could be reasonably said that that could be y equals 2, and it looks very asymptotic on this side. So what I'm seeing is it looks like this is absolutely true as x approaches negative infinity. But take a look at the picture on the right. Now again, our assumption with these pictures is that you're given enough to draw a conclusion and not that it goes like this afterwards. So in other words, looking at the picture, it looks to me like this limit, as x approaches infinity of f of x, it looks like that is actually equal to infinity because the graph appears to be increasing and growing without bound as x approaches infinity. So what that tells me is that since infinity and two are different, otherwise I'd have a whole heck of a lot of money and be very, very rich. Since that's true, this could not be f of x. And specifically, it's because that right horizontal asymptote is not two. In fact, there doesn't appear to be a horizontal asymptote as x goes to infinity. So again, the explanation is better written on the visual or on the verbal solution or the written solutions that I have. But for the moment, just to kind of illustrate the thinking behind it, we take what they tell us and we look to see does that match the behavior of the graph in a reasonable way. So there you go. There's 22. Okay, that brings us to question 24, and then I think we're down to our final stretch. So in 24, it says the graph of y equals cx cubed plus 4 over 2x cubed minus d has horizontal asymptote y equals 3 and vertical asymptote x equals 5, and it wants us to find c and d. Well, if it wanted us to find cd, I could point you to an entire stand in my closet since I don't really listen to music that way anymore. Too bad, too. As far as these, though, they want us to find the values of c and d, the scalars c and d, or the scalar c and the constant d, that allow, or that allow this function to have the proper horizontal and vertical asymptotes. So let's look first at the horizontal asymptote, because it was written into the question first, and see what happens. So with horizontal asymptotes, we're asked about the limit as x approaches infinity or negative infinity. For simplicity, I'm going to write this one as just infinity, because I see that this is a rational expression as it's a ratio of polynomials, so there will only be one horizontal asymptote. As far as what this limit's equal to, you can imagine us, if you want to, multiplying up and down by one over x cubed. Again, you should do this properly. When we do, we're going to end up getting c over two. So, not a bad thing. In fact, there's no d to even worry about here. And it says it has a horizontal asymptote at y equals three, so c over two has to equal three. And again, without being too difficult, that means C has to equal six. So this wasn't even a particularly difficult starting task here, as long as we knew how to calculate a horizontal asymptote. That brings us to the vertical asymptote portion. So we need to look at the vertical asymptote. So for our vertical asymptote, the way we get a vertical asymptote is that we have the denominator equal to zero. And not the numerator, but that won't be a problem here based on what we're seeing. So if 2x cubed minus d has to equal 0, we have to be careful. It would seem like that's unsolvable because we have an x and a d. But that's because my statement is actually incorrect. It's not 2x to the third minus d equals 0. It's specifically that 2 times 5 to the third, since our vertical asymptote is x equals 5, it's 2 times 5 to the third minus d that's equal to 0. And that's really easy to solve. That's 2 times 125 minus d equals 0. And more importantly, that's 250 equals D. So in order to get the proper pieces that we want, there is what we would be looking at. 
So we found both values, but they requ it required us to know both how to construct a horizontal asymptote from a rational expression and how to find a vertical asymptote from a rational expression. So there you go. Okay, and last but not least, that brings us to question 25. 25 has some really um, interesting things to think about in parts C and D, as well as some valuable interrogations in parts A and B. So in 25, it says the graph at right, for us it's a little bit below, but forgive me. The graph at right gives the piecewise linear function g of x. Use the graph to answer the questions. So there are a couple different ways to approach this, but what I choose to do, and what I think is the easiest, is I'm just going to start by figuring out what this piecewise function g of x actually is. I think that's a really good way to begin to attack a problem with a piecewise linear function. So I want to write this as a piecewise. What I notice is that I've got one line here as x approaches 2, and one line as x leaves 2. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up my piecewise as something when x is less than 2, and something when x is greater than or equal to 2. And again, it doesn't really matter when I choose the or equal to because they intersect each other at 2, for what that's worth. So given this, I want to now find the equation of each line segment. So looking over here, I can see some evidence, by the way, that the slope here is up 2 over 1 or 2, which means that this point should be in play. And I think it's easiest then to construct that the part when x is less than 2 is going to have slope 2, and thus be 2x, and then minus 2, since negative 2 is the y-intercept. Really fast to get there. Now the second one is a little bit more of a mess. It has slope down 2 over 1, 2, 3. So it has slope negative 2 thirds. So in other words, y equals negative 2 thirds x plus the y-intercept. But to find that y-intercept, we need to plug in a point. And what I'm going to choose to go with is the point up here of intersection 2 comma 2. So 2 is equal to negative 2 thirds times 2 plus b. That means 2 is equal to negative 4 thirds plus b. And since 2 is the same thing as 6 thirds, that means b is equal to 10 thirds. So we actually could fairly quickly, I think, I'm pretty proud of that effort, get the equation of the line segment on the right for when x is greater than or equal to 2 as negative 2 thirds x plus 10 thirds. Good job, us. Now, of course, this hasn't answered our question at all, which is asking us to evaluate a ratio limit. But eh, we got somewhere. So let, let's let what it, let, blah, 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 blah. what that allows us to do then is to evaluate the limit as x approaches infinity of 6x over g of x, or 6x plus 1 over g of x. But here's the thing. Infinity, I feel like I'm make, stating obvious things, but infinity is definitely greater than 2. Would you agree? Yeah. If you have $2 and someone else has infinity, they, they have more. So from in here, if infinity is greater than 2, we want the portion where infinity happens, which is this second line segment, which means that this limit is actually negative 2 thirds x plus 10 thirds in the denominator. Now, of course, we've done this many times before. If we're going to do this, evaluate this limit formally, we can multiply up and down by 1 over x. And hopefully you'll be okay with me realizing that that means that we'll get 6 in the numerator and negative 2 thirds in the denominator. Multiplying this through, lots of different ways to do it. I'm going to multiply up and down by negative 2 thirds, or negative 3 halves. This, of course, in the denominator goes to 1. In our numerator, we're going to get negative 18 over 2, which gives us negative 9. And so there is the value of our limit. And again, what we did was we figured out what the function was, what that piecewise function was, and we used the appropriate branch as x went to infinity. Pretty interesting, actually. That brings us then to part B, which asks us to do the same thing, but this time as x goes to negative infinity. So a similar piece. So what I'm going to do is I'm again going to take advantage of work that's already been done. I'm going to steal the piecewise function itself, stick it right there in our problem, and then let's evaluate this. So we want to do the limit as x approaches negative infinity this time of g of x over 2x. Looking at our function, negative infinity is clearly less than 2 which means that we want to use the top branch, which is itself 2x minus 2. And however it is that you get to this point, we're eventually going to get 2x over 2, which is 1. So definitely the same process. We could be as formal as we wanted to, but in this case, we end up with a ratio of 1. And again, it just came down to understanding the behavior of the function. And again, being able to construct the equation of a line really helped. 
That, though, brings us to the limit as x approaches 1 from the left side of 2 over g of x. And here's the problem. As x approaches 1 from both the left and the right, we get 0, which in a sense means this is going to 2 over 0. So some people would want to argue that this is undefined. But unfortunately, because we're approaching 1 from the left side, this is actually a one-sided limit. So undefined is unacceptable, and 2 over 0 isn't really descriptive. Your calculator is going to spit that right back out at you. So we don't get to do that instead. Instead, what we want to do is we want to think about what's happening here. So a couple pieces. Like if we were being super formal, we were approaching it with a British sense of dedication. Oh, I'm so good at the accents. We would end up with this. And the problem is, of course, the numerator is 2, and the denominator, as we said, goes to 0. But here's the thing. The denominator does go to 0. In fact, I'm going to focus my attention down there. This thing does go to 0, but let's be specific about the way it approaches 0. So if we're looking at 1 from the left side, you notice that all of those x values are producing negative y values. So this is actually approaching 0 from the left side through negative values. But let's see. Here, we'll do it this way. I'm trying to think of the best way to write this in without cheating and looking at my stuff. So here's what I'm going to write. So as x approaches 1 from the left side, g of x approaches 0, but with g of x always less than 0. So can you agree with that? Looking at the picture, would you agree that that's true? So what that's saying is, although we do know that 2 over 0 does kind of go to infinity, in a sense this isn't just going to infinity in this particular case. Since we're going to infinity, but through negative numbers, that's like saying that this is 2 over some negative number. In fact, let's think about it that way. In a sense, it's 2 dot 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 0, but it's negative stuff in order to get there. So what that leads us to is the fact that this is actually not infinity, but negative infinity. As we approach from that direction, we actually get negative infinity because g of x is less than 0 for x less than 1. So in a sense, if we had approached this particular limit from the right side, since all the g values are positive there, this would have produced a limit of positive infinity. So let's go take a look really fast and see if this is actually true. So we are doing 2 over g of x. So let's clean this up a little bit. Go g of x is for x less than 2, 2x two minus 2. We saw that before. And then we were interested in the function y equals 2 divided by g of x. Now we're curious what's happening as x approaches 0, or x approaches 1 from the left side. As we approach 1, look at our function. It goes down to negative infinity just like we expected. And on the right side where the values are positive, it goes up to positive infinity just like we talked about. So this is a really tiny wrinkle, but a pretty cool and powerful thing to be able to look at. Turns out that considering what's happening around the function, that neighborhood and that general behavior really is essential in this particular case. So very interesting. And that brings us to our last question, question D, or 25D. Just as to evaluate the limit as x approaches 5 from the left side of 7 over g of x. So we're approaching 5 from the left side, so we're going in that direction. So following the same thing, this is definitely approaching 7 over 0, which is a problem, except 7 over 0 isn't the answer. That is equal to infinity, but in this case, we're going to get positive infinity. And our reason is because g of x is greater than 0, or positive, as x approaches 5 from the left side. Did I do that right? For x, yeah, there we go. I should have said for x less than 5, but whatever. So in a sense, there is our value. And you can imagine what we're seeing is how it is that a function produces vertical asymptotes, for, or that approach, or portions of a graph that go in different directions. So although we got plus infinity here, it's worth pointing out that you actually somewhat understand this already. So in a sense, think about the simplest function, the linear parent graph y equals x. Would you agree this parent graph looks like that, right? Has a 0 at x equals 0. Now let's think about its reciprocal function, 1 over x. We know that thing has a vertical asymptote here. And on the left side, since the numbers are negative, 
follows that behavior. On the right side, the numbers are positive. So if we look at the limit of, of 1 over x as x approaches infinity, since it's going, to, or as x approaches 0 from the right side, since all the values are positive, we would get positive infinity. And if we approach 0 from the left side, where all the values are negative, we would get negative infinity. So actually, this isn't any sort of new information. It's just kind of a new way of thinking about it, bringing in some knowledge about one-sided limits. And with that said, that ends all the information that I was planning to provide you from this homework assignment or this problem set. Hopefully, this has been really helpful. As I said, since for me, it's the 4th of July. Happy 4th of July, and have a great day.